Spring is definitely popping up throughout the vegetable garden. We'll take a closer look right after this. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the Garden Home. Well, spring is definitely here. You can tell by these gorgeous white emperor tulips. Aren't they fantastic? And I'm equally excited by all these vegetables you can see in my vegetable garden. Lettuce, carrots, peas, and lots of seedlings, which eventually will yield a bountiful harvest. Today we're exploring vegetables in the garden, starting with the spring crop, then touching on the bounty of summer, and then returning to cool season produce as we round out the growing season in the garden with fall. Of course, for you really hardcore gardeners who are wanting to garden year round, we'll talk about a few greenhouses for winter growing too. So why don't we get started with a tour of this space? It's my organic vegetable garden, come on. In the beginning, this place looked a little rough with bare earth that had to be divided into terraces. And that's where these dry stack stone walls came in. They provided instant style, they helped to organize the space, and they created a sense of enclosure. Now at each end of the garden, I put up these arbors, and the raised beds between them, well, they brought the space to life. And then, well, there's the garden pool, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Now this is one of my favorite places because this arbor is going to be covered with grapes. You can see they're already off to a very good start. Such vigorous growers. Now I have it lined with these old fashioned bearded iris and on just the other side of this arbor I have white renaissance spirea. It's in full bloom today and just beyond you can smell the aroma of the Saravan fleet roses. Now I want you to envision something for a moment. You see by midsummer these grapes will have covered this arbor. This arbor is 40 feet long, so it's going to be a tunnel of green all the way down to the lawn. Now eventually we're going to get this covered in gravel, which will carry you over here to the lawn. Come on, let me show you. Now just take a look at this. What a difference this made before it was just a dirt path, and now we have a mixed fescue lawn, bordered by these raised beds which are packed with flowers. Now it looks like the lawn could use a little bit of a haircut, and we'll get to that later in the week. But right now I just want you to focus on how these beds are so full of flowers. Now beyond to help create a sense of garden rooms in the vegetable garden, I have these really great looking espalier trees. Now these are kefir pears and they're in the candelabra formation, which is really gorgeous. I found these from a grower in Tennessee. Now when I started out, I planted them on the arbors and I didn't like them there because it was actually gonna distort this gorgeous shape. So I decided to put the grapes on the arbor and move these espaliered pear trees out here to help create a sense of garden rooms or individual spaces. Now when you think about the size of this vegetable garden, just this half of it, this section is 80 feet long. So these trees really help break up the spaces. They create a sense of enclosure and just make the whole experience more visually interesting. Now as we move from east to west, you come to this space, which is the rondelle. Now right now it's not quite finished. You see, it looks like I've got a giant crater in the middle of it. I had a contractor start the project, then he got too busy to finish it. Now I've got somebody who's gonna come along and get this wrapped up here in the next couple of weeks. I'm very excited about it. You see, this will be a simple pool with a single jet of water. It'll be a great place for me to experiment with water plants. This is the center of the vegetable garden and it's all planted white, mainly with white roses, but these four trees on the corner are vitex. They bloom a pale lavender in summer and the honeybees love them. Now I mentioned roses are planted here, and I love roses, I could go on and on and on about them, but I'm gonna have to save that for another time. I've always tried to use my gardens as teaching tools, and this one is no exception. You see, when I started this organic vegetable garden, I wanted to make it really a place where I could experiment both with vegetables and flowers in an organic environment. Now, one of the keys to this was the soil and getting it right. Now here's some tips that may help you as you create your own organic garden. First, you might think about raised beds. Sure, they look nice, 
but one of the keys to their design is to make a series of manageable spaces. You see, you can reach across them, you can weed them, and you can plant them very easily. Now, the soil is the key to success of any gardening project. Now, what is so great about these raised beds is that you can create your own soil mix. You can get it right from the very beginning. Now, what I did here in terms of the soil mix was very simple. I took one part good loam, just some good basic topsoil. I mixed it with one part compost. It was well decomposed, and you need to make sure of that. And the third was sand for good drainage. So with those three products, loam, compost, and sand blended together. That was the beginning of the soil that I placed in these raised beds. And just look at the bounty. I just can't tell you what a colossal help this greenhouse has been. It allowed me to get a lot of things actually sown and in the ground back in the late winter. These were some of the vegetables that are in the garden now, some of the early spring things that can take cool weather, like lettuces and broccoli and so forth, even some flowers. Well, now I'm bringing out some of my summer favorites. These little cayenne peppers are ready to go out into the garden because the threat of frost has now passed. Now, when you start seedlings like this, there are a few tips you may want to know. One of the things I keep in mind is, when am I going to move them outside and plant them in the garden? And temperature and weather plays a huge role in this. You want to make sure that you've got the last frost date down. You don't want to move them out until that date has passed. Now, you also want to make sure that you give them plenty of light. That's going to make the strongest plant possible. Now, if you're starting them in a dark place, like a garage or basement, then be sure to supplement the natural light with grow lights. Now here's another tip in getting those little seed to germinate. A heating mat can be very helpful, so give it a try. I've got two greenhouses and two very different gardens. One is a twin wall polycarbonate design and the other is a classic glass house. It took a team of two guys a day to put up each of the houses, but of course we had the foundation in place when they started their work. You can see from this time-lapse photography how quickly assembly can be done with two experienced builders. I asked greenhouse expert Andrew Cook, who's used these structures since his youth in the Netherlands, what Americans need to know about greenhouses. How would one gauge what size greenhouse they should have? That really is, there is no rule. Initially it starts off with, I have so many plants that are sort of summer outdoor plants that in the winter need protection. You start storing your outdoor plants in the winter, you start growing in the greenhouse as well. And that part of it then is up to the imagination. These are some of my babies that I carry over from year to year, like my citrus trees and things like that. See, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Just keep them inside, that's what we do with them. Absolutely. What about just, um, I guess I'm always concerned about uh, breaking the glass of a greenhouse uh, or it being damaged in, in um, you know, a hailstorm or something like that. Yeah, we, even on a glass greenhouse these days you have good safety glass. But the polycarbonate is a better material. It is stronger. That is, is particularly also with the curvature of the roof, uh, no shoulder. So we have a, a, a more unique shape. But that shape allows the wind to blow over and the hill bounces off, uh, right. ricochets off the shape of the roof. And because of all this twin wall polycarbonate, it is somewhat flexible. Are there certain things one should keep in mind in siding a greenhouse on your property? Oh, absolutely. Um, in a hobby greenhouse, generally, some protection is required. And a, a natural fence, barriers, tree lines, things like that. Here we have the garage, yeah. we have a hedge and, a f and fencing around Absolutely. this particular area. This is very, very good. We recommend to have it somewhere near the side of a house or something like that. Uh, if you have it freestanding, you're going to need to do some extra. You need to make sure that it's well anchored into the ground. In this case, we've used concrete block. Correct. Now, Andrew, obviously in a greenhouse of any size, ventilation is important. Yeah, it's very important, particularly in the United States where the climate is much warmer. And traditionally, the greenhouse concept is an English, Northern European concept. And uh, many of those greenhouses actually are not well enough ventilated for the United States. Yeah. Uh, we get cold here, yeah. but we get easily very warm it in can the get, daytime. It can get very warm <laughs> here yeah. in the early so, spring. Correct, yeah. exactly. So in a greenhouse like this, the big important thing is a, is a through draft. 
When heating a greenhouse like this, a, a hobbyist greenhouse, what are the things you should consider? Oh, first of all, size. Uh, how big is it? How much do you want to heat it up? The second thing is, what is the temperature that is desired? Usually, the desired temperature is about 52 degrees for general plants. Yeah. Orchids really need about 62 degrees. Yeah, bump it up a yeah, little bit. Bump it up a little bit. Yeah. So it depends on that. So the BTUs, which is what a greenhouse heater is generally expressed in, could use anywhere from maybe 10,000 to 20,000 BTUs for a small one. Well, I feel like I'm prepared for that coldest night in January now. Yes, you are. Well, thank you so much. Oh, welcome. Now, putting your greenhouse to work is as simple as gathering up some cell trays or peat pods. They're great for starting seedlings. You can fill them with a good quality potting soil and sprinkle in the seeds, water, and let nature go to work. Now, one tip you might keep in mind, rather than taking the little seedlings directly from the greenhouse out into the garden, what I like to do is give them a period of transition and I set them outside where they can sort of harden off. They become used to the outdoor environment. This really puts them in good stead before you plant them directly into the garden. About a week is all they need. During a visit to Callaway Gardens in Pine Mountain, Georgia, I saw how they put this idea of starting seedlings and greenhouses to work, giving them a jump start on their produce display garden. Do you prefer to grow them from seed or plants? We start most of ours from, uh, from plants outside. We direct seed the seed in a greenhouse and then bring them out after about four weeks in a greenhouse. And then this is five weeks after that. So these are actually nine weeks from seed. How many different varieties are you growing here this year? We have about 30 varieties of lettuce that we're trialing in this garden this year. Good heavens, they're beautiful. Which one is your favorite, David? I guess I'm kind of partial to the one called Nancy, which is a lighter green, one of the butterhead types. Right. And this seems to be a fast growing, which is uh, a secret to no bug problems and that type thing. So it's a good fast growing butterhead lettuce. I have to say one of the things I really enjoy about having this garden is it gives me an opportunity to experiment with some of those time-honored old-fashioned favorites like all those varieties of lettuce, peppers and tomatoes and of course the flowers such as larkspur, poppies, bachelor buttons. If you're interested in learning about plants from the past you might consider a trip to a place like this. This is Strawberry Bank in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Here gardens representing the different time periods of this historic neighborhood bring the past to life. Well, we're here in our oldest garden at Strawberry Bank. It's the Sherburn Garden, and it's a raised bed kitchen garden from 1695. We have raised beds in this garden because the archaeological evidence pointed to beds about three feet below the sur soil surface at present. And they had wooden boards, and they had rich garden soil, and a lot of the crops we were planting in them are garden plants that we know are here because of soil and pollen analysis. So when we maintain these, we try and work with period tools and technologies. Reproduction artifacts also help give us a sense of why gardens appeared as they did and what inventories tell us people were growing and using and the tools that they had in their homes. Something like this that works on vacuum pressure allowed you to start and stop the flow but it also enabled people to conserve a water resource when maybe they were just gathering up water from the drip line of their house. So one of the unique things about teaching from garden history is that we can pair up past and present understanding. We know that historically sage was used to make dressing, stuffing for your turkey or for waterfowl. Today we know that it's antibacterial in its nature and that people didn't use herbs and spices to mask the flavor of rotting meats, but that they used the herbs and spices which actually help preserve these foods in the process. So at Strawberry Bank, we teach about change over time in the landscape. Instead of our earliest 17th century raised bed kitchen garden, afternoon, Ms. Tucker. Good afternoon, dear. We have a victory garden from World War II that's a part of our site as well. Instead of the ceramic watering pot from the 17th century, the metal watering can of the 1940s. Instead of pot marigolds, we have four o'clocks. And instead of the sage, the seasoning that's probably still on your shelf from the 1940s as well. The American garden changed and developed a great deal from the time the first colonists came here to the time when we planted gardens for victory. 
Victory Gardens connected us up as a nation with the value of gardening in our own backyard and reminded us about the well-being that just comes from cultivating the soil. The gardens at Strawberry Bank helped teach all of us not just what it was like in the 17th century, in the 20th century, but what we can do and learn from all of the garden styles here. Instead of reseeded raised bed gardens, we have planting in rows, things like carrots. And instead of the white carrot, they're the orange carrots of the 20th century. They're all plants that prove meaningful in people's lives and that keep regionalism and historic and open pollinated heirlooms as a part of the story for today and for our futures. Today's virtual makeover comes from John in New Jersey, and he's got some challenges he's trying to overcome. The back of his property backs up to a thousand acre park, which is basically full of deer, and they come into his garden and eat everything he plants. So he's looking for some solutions for the deer, and he also is not interested in lawn. He wants an entire garden that's completely planted out, which reminds me of a very dear friend of mine who has a charming New England salt box cottage where she has a similar philosophy. Living out here in the country and having lots of acreage, you could have as large a garden as you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, physically, I don't think Doug and I could handle it. <laughs> Well, no, so was it, it was it maintenance that... Uh, well, it's kind of kept me contained because by the time I get through working on this one, there's little time left. To, you couldn't possibly to even and, dream of uh, thinking right, of another, right. another area to garden. And I like the old-fashioned things like the pinks and the foxgloves and hollyhocks. And if you perfect. wanted to retire the lawnmower That's, for good... That is exactly right. <laughs> you could have a, a garden like this with a with a mulch path and lots of flowers. In fact, when I'm in town and I see these little houses with their little lawns, I think if that were mine, I'd build a picket fence all the way around it and plant flowers, no lawn. Now John, if we take our lead from Nancy's design, this is what I would suggest. Why don't we start with a picket fence? Now hers was natural wood to match the house. And what you may want to do is match the color of your fence. And I would start it up here at the step with a post and then bring it across the lawn which would make this a planting space and then I would bring the fence across here with about two feet of space between this raised bed or border you have here across for planting. So the picket fence would run across like this all the way down the post and picket motif and then in front, you could plant that with a wide range of things. What I would suggest are two deer-proof plants. I would do a series of boxwoods all the way across here every eight feet to create a sense of rhythm. And then I would plant between them Russian sage, which has a beautiful gray foliage all the way across here. Be great in the summer. And then I would take that boxwood and create a hedge of it all the way across like that. Deer will not eat boxwood or Russian sage, so you're in good shape there. Then I would have a picket fence gate here going into the garden, just like we saw at Nancy's, with a walkway that comes out to your driveway. So you would walk into the garden this way through a gate and down a path all the way to some sort of arbor with a bench to sit in. Then on each side, you could plant all the flowers and vegetables you want. Now, I would let that path turn the corner and go over here onto the north side of the house, and maybe you go through an arbor over here where you could plant an old-fashioned rose. If you get the rose blooms up high enough, the deer won't bother them. And then on this side of the house, I would fill that with all kinds of hydrangeas, uh, particularly those gorgeous big blue ones, hydrangea macrophylla, Nico Blue is an old favorite. Then here in the front, I would probably, to give myself a little privacy here, what I would do is plant probably a weeping cherry, which has pale pink blooms, which would be, I think, beautiful there in the front. And on each side of the front door, for the summer, I would put large containers and plant the fairy rose in there. It's one from the 1930s, and it's a great old standby and perfect for growing in containers. Well, those are just a few ideas, John, and I hope they help. Good luck with your project.
wish we were as far along with the house as we are with the garden. Just look at the bounty here. The spinach is really ready to harvest. When I come out into the garden to gather things, I like to bring a colander like this, fill it up with whatever I'm picking, and take it directly into the kitchen and put it under the sink. There I can thoroughly wash the leaves. Now one tip, if you store the leaves for using later, make sure you dry them off thoroughly with a paper towel or a cloth towel because if you put them in wet, you're creating an environment for bacteria to grow. And no one wants to invite bacteria to the table. Now we've talked a lot about what I'm growing this spring. But when fall rolls around, how different will this garden look? Well, a lot of the things that I grew in the summer, such as many of the flowers like cosmos and sunflowers, well, they'll be finishing up. But I'll replant a lot of these cool season vegetables, just as you're seeing here. Spinach, lettuce, broccoli, cauliflower, all of those things that like cool temperatures, I'll plant in late summer and I have a beautiful fall crop. Now you may be asking, so how's the garden gonna look different in the summer? Well, first of all, I've got to tell you, all these leafy greens will have to go because we're going to make room for the hot weather crops. I've already started peppers in my glass house, and we'll move those out into raised beds in the coming weeks. Soon to follow are beans, eggplant, squash, cucumbers, you name it, and they'll all be welcome additions. The summer menu continues with fruits and herbs like strawberries, figs, parsley, sage, thyme, chives. And of course, what would a vegetable garden be without that all-time summer classic, the tomato? Now, did you know that the U.S. is the largest producer of tomatoes in the entire world and that we consume over 12 million tons, that's tons of tomatoes a year? That averages for every man, woman, and child 18 pounds of fresh tomatoes and 70 pounds of processed tomatoes, whether they're in sauces, salsa, or ketchup. And a statistic that's close to my heart is that 25 to 40 million of us plant tomatoes in our gardens every year. Pests like tomatoes as much as we do. So in order to stay one step ahead of them, I never plant mine in the same place from one year to the next. Pests can build up in your soil over time. So by moving your plants around, you can throw them off a bit. But one pest that always seems to find my tomatoes no matter where I plant them is the cutworm. To discourage them from taking out my young plants, I wrap the base of each seedling with a piece of aluminum foil. Then later in the season, I'll keep the caterpillars away by spraying BT. It's safe and very effective. Now a well-fed tomato plant will provide you with a high yield. And a fun way to feed them is to use an old milk carton. Just punch a few holes in the side and the bottom of the milk carton and bury one next to each plant. Then just fill them up with water or liquid fertilizer and the carton will release the nutrient to the plants over time. With all of my plants planted, now I'll just mulch them in and place a wire cage like this over them for support later in the season. Have you ever wondered how all this tomato mania got started? Well, it goes way back. You see, the tomato was first introduced from South America to Europe in the 1500s. Southern Europeans regarded it as the love apple, and it was used as an aphrodisiac. Now, the English had a whole different attitude about this plant. You see, they considered it poisonous and only grew it in their gardens as a curiosity. Now, there are a lot of theories out there as far as how the tomato was first introduced into this country. You see, because it was brought here by English colonists, they regarded it as, of course, poisonous. So it got off to a slow and rocky start. It was really through the 18th century and early 19th century, it began to grow in popularity. But it was really 100 years later, almost to the Civil War, where it became popular. And once it did, it took off like a rocket. And I'm happy to say that it did. Well, it's time to take these inside. I've got a feast for the palate and a feast for the eyes. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. My garden is exploding with blooms. What kind of blooms? Roses, of course. From planting tips to new varieties and old favorites, you'll see an array of beautiful blooms that are sure to inspire you to get out there and grow something. And because roses are reliably perennial, you'll be planting them for the seasons ahead. 
I'm going to share all these roses with you and many more on the garden home.